right. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to listen to us. Um, we're here today, as you just heard, to talk about building, building stellar startup teams. So we're going to touch on hiring, meaning identifying, vetting, and appealing to great talent. And then we're also going to touch on org building and leadership. So when and how should you grow your team, and how should you lead it? I'm Mikko, I'm an early stage founder, and today I have the exceptional privilege to be asking all my hiring and leadership questions from Brooke, who is an exceptional HR practitioner. <laughs> so Brooke, let's start off with an icebreaker. Uh, what's the best hire you ever made and why? Okay, this is really tough, especially because I spent many years as a recruiter, so I feel like I feel proud of each person that I sent an offer letter to, whether they were, you know, someone that stayed and moved around the company or someone that, you know, did something for six months and then went and did something else. Like, I think there's always a, a learning. Um, I'm going to keep this a little bit anonymous, but I think my one of the hires that I'm the most proud of is somebody that joined Agen, worked across three different teams, two different countries, uh, became a leader. Like, those are my favorite stories, is someone that doesn't just do the role that you hired them for, but just does something totally different. That does sound good. And let's make sure that over the next 20 or so minutes, we tell founders how they can always make hires of this, of this caliber that you just described. But let's dive in. So when I founded Realm, the first question I had to think about is like, how do I convince someone to join a company that they've never heard of, which has zero customers, and can't afford them to pay as much as they're worth? So how do you convince great talent to join against all odds? Yeah, so it's funny. I get this question a lot. Also, sometimes when I meet with customers, they're like, yeah, you have this big name, people know of you, which I always find really funny because I think for us, we still feel like we're at this really early days of our journey. Um, and when I joined Agen back in 2017 uh, in our San Francisco office, let me tell you, we weren't the financial technology company on the tip of everyone's tongue. Um, so it was really about, I think, appealing to the right kind of people because if someone's looking to just join a big name company, they're going to go try to join a big name company. So what's your story? And I think for us at the time, we're like, what's unique about us? You know, we're not an American company. We have roots in Europe, but we're super global. We started with enterprise. Like what a crazy starting point for, uh, for a company. Like we tried to find those little nuggets that would make us stand out. And we knew that, you know, on the recruiting side or as a hiring manager, like you're in the sales pitch. You're saying like, not what we are today, but where we're going. And if you get that story going, I, that's how you, how you get somebody. Okay, that's awesome. And then let's talk about vetting talent in, in the recruiting process. And I have to say, something that haunts me as a founder is that I'm yet to like, form a clear correlation between my best hires and my worst hires. Like I saw the potential in some people, but I failed to see like, the red flags in, in others. So what have I done wrong? What should I do in a hiring process to truly understand what someone's like, potential is? So I'm going to let you in on a top industry secret. Okay. <laughs> no one has figured this out perfectly. Right. <laughs> and um, everyone makes mistakes, right? Like you can have what you think is the most objective process. You can focus so much on skills. You can uh, be very data driven, but you'll still make one hire that you think, eh, this is a little risky and they're going to be the best person on your team. And then you hire the next person. Um, who aced all your technical tests and you know, blew everybody away. And then in practice, like, they're just not the person that was needed at your company. So I actually think more than like, beating yourself up about being perfect in hiring, you should actually think through like, what are the elements that like, got somebody impactful very quickly? Like, did we spend way too long just in onboarding and we never got to actually test someone in the real world? Um, or did we throw someone so much in the deep end that they're like, what's the company's name that I work for? <laughs> Makes sense. So let's, let's actually let's talk about that a little bit and, and then jump back to hiring. Like, what should you be doing for the, say, first six months after you hired someone? Like, let's say it's someone you're going to be leading. What should happen within those six months to set them up for success? Yeah, my feeling is that can be quite different company to company. It can depend on the complexity of your product, I think. Um, you know, if you're a multi-product organization and you, the, you need someone to have a really wide breadth of knowledge, like that's going to be a longer onboarding phase. Like I, um, I know we have certain teams at Aja and like our account management team is amazing and they have such deep product knowledge. You know, they start working with customers quite quickly, but it's really, sometimes we say it's like four, six months before they are like that expert in the room and you have to give people that time to, 
to learn. But I think the lesson that I've learned on my team, but also with other teams is how can you get someone actually doing something as quickly as possible? Maybe that's just me. I just hate being in onboarding sessions endlessly. Like, like when do I actually get to do something? So uh, I remember my first day at Agile, and one of my favorite things was I had just gotten my laptop. Like, I, I hadn't even logged into everything. And then someone was like, hey, can you jump in this interview? And I was like, OK, cool. And like, I like that spirit. Like, get people into the energy of your company as quickly as possible. Like, the longer you feel new, the less impact you have. That's awesome. And is there something you can do while you're still in the recruiting process that would sort of simulate that? Or is the only way to get a person in and then evaluate them over the first few months? I'm a huge believer in case studies. Yeah. And I think that in, in thinking about what type of case study or technical exercise, I think that's where people sometimes cut corners. But if you can actually think of a case study that gives... Ooh, we're moving. <laughs> um, if you can think of a case study that actually gives people a taste of the work that they'll do in that role, it serves two functions. You get a realistic view of their performance, though, of course, maybe they have way less context. Um, but the other piece of it is that they will actually get an understanding of what that role looks like, and they'll know if it's for them or not. Because I think the piece that people often miss about recruiting processes is you, you want someone to join your company that wants to be at your company. And if you are selling this glossy picture that is unrealistic, you're hiding all your uh, you know, warts and bad edges, like, that's going to catch up with you eventually. Like, how do you give them a realistic view into what their job would actually look like? That's so interesting, because a mistake I have certainly made is that when you're hiring sort of senior candidates, or you get really into like trying to convince someone to join your company, um, you feel the urge to compromise <laughs> on like your principles. Like you say, you, you go talk to your co-founders and say like, we should pay this person more than we agreed to pay, or you want to let them work remotely even though your company is on site. So like, what should you and should you not do to convince uh, a great candidate? Yeah. I understand the temptation, especially like when you're getting your founding team, you know, every person means so much. You need all stars. You can't have any dead weight. <laughs> um, but I think ultimately, like the lesson that I've learned, like with Ajahn having such a long term view, like we, we're always thinking, you know, not what's this person going to do in this role, but what's their next role? What are they doing five years from now? And it's the same way that we build our products, right? In, um, financial services, things take a long time to come to fruition. So we need to have this very long-term time horizon. Um, so we try to apply, apply the same thing when making decisions or compromises or stretches. Is like there's a lot of beauty and flexibility, especially if you're, you know, if you're buying knowledge that's very hard to find. But don't compromise. Like an uh, example of this, I've chatted with a few company leaders where they've made a compromise with like, senior people that want special treatment. And I'm like, that's going to say a lot about your culture. If, you, you know, if you're an in-office environment, and then you hire this very senior leader, and you say, like, yeah, but they work in Honolulu because they're senior. But like, first of all, how's that person going to transfer their knowledge to the team? That's kind of the person that you want in the middle of the office. You want everyone learning from them if they're really that, that special. So you've made this compromise that actually kind of negates the talent that you just bought. Um, so I would always think of that longer term time horizon and what, what it will actually mean to your, your culture if you make this compromise. You know, if you're stretching and like paying someone a bit more, like that you can probably live with if they're worth it. But if you set up a structure you have to live with for the next five years, will you regret it? And so let's say I was, I was interviewing for your team. To what extent would it be like, hey, look, Mikko, this is like the most incredible thing you can ever do. You're going to learn more than anywhere else. And to what extent it's going to be like, you know, the long, hours are long. We may still go bankrupt. We haven't made it. Like, what's the balance between those two things? It has to be a mix, right? I mean, I think, especially if you're building your own team, hopefully you are excited about yeah, the team perfect. that you're building. So you should have that vision that you can share. So, you know, I always share, here's where we're at today, but like, here's this shiny thing of where we're headed, and like I want you to be a part of it. Um, but I also like to confront people with some realities of like, have you thought through this? I mean, for us, it's easy. Like, we're a super global company, and our teams work across borders. So I always say, if you have a 9 to 5 mentality, like that's great for you, but your colleague around the world is going to be up at 6 AM to accommodate your schedule. So like, 
yes, we want to have uh, a good balance in how we work, but we need to be good teammates. And that also means that if you have a very rigid schedule, it's not going to work. So if that doesn't work with your life, totally get it, but that's where we're at. So it sounds simple, but I think it's better to be blunt on a few of those things. Uh, I've learned some of the Dutch directness in my uh, <laughs> agent times. <laughs> That's good. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, one question we frequently think about at Realm is like experience versus potential. Like there's a hiring process and you have an amazing ex-Google engineer who's already sort of nearing the end of their career and you have someone completely unproven out of university but who's like super smart. So how, how do you think about this? When do you hire senior talent and when do you bet on, on junior talent? It's a good question. I think ultimately, I always think you benefit from a mix and different stages of companies and different types of companies might like a different mix. Um, I think it's really, I think it's a real transition to go from a very large company to a small startup. And I think that there's a lot of times where that doesn't work out. And I think you should always be really honest about that. I think as a, as a recruiter in my past, I always really liked profiles of someone that had already gone from a big company to a small company because then someone else had done that work <laughs> of that adjustment. And you know that this person like, knows what they're getting into. Um, I actually think that someone from a very, very, very large company going somewhere small is a bigger risk than taking a bet on experience. Um, but we always say like, you also need some people in the room with some, some miles on the odometer. Um, so some people that have seen things before, especially when it comes to like, more leadership topics. Um, I think we'll probably talk about this, but I always say like no one starts as a good leader, no one starts as a good manager. The first person somebody has to let go, that's never a perfectly run <laughs> experience. So it's good to have some people in your organization, especially as you start to grow a little bit bigger, that have, that have done some of those things before. All right, and I, I, I'm too curious, I have to ask. So you've spent you know, more than a decade hiring people. You must have hundred, hired hundreds of people. Let's say you were out looking for a job, like maybe, maybe that's going to happen one day. What would you, how would you prepare as a candidate? What would you like, what is the recruiter inside tips for someone who is uh, <laughs> applying for a job? Yeah. It's a good question. I, I do so many interviews and my thing is like the candidates that stand out, it's always in their questions. It's almost never in their answers. Um, I think that particularly where I've worked, like we just need curious minds. <laughs> Um, so a really polished, beautiful interview answer is not, you know, that's fine, but that's not going to tell us if this person will like be the right person to scale our platform. So I always, I try to, first of all, I always leave a lot of time for questions, but also if I'm coming in as an interviewee, I think asking questions that are like beyond that surface level, you know, I will say like every person you talk to asks, what do you like about the culture? What's different between what you joined like then and now? But I love when someone's like stick going in about our business of like, oh, in this market, you have this competitor. Like, how do you deal with this? Or, um, you know, I, I saw this in your financials. Like, what are you doing with that? Oh, like, you got this banking license. Like, why did you do that? That's, that's a lot of work. Yeah, now you have all this regulatory environment. Why did you do that? I think showing that next layer of curiosity, you just immediately stand out from the crowd. And it shows that you have like the critical thinking that we're testing for. Um, and my assumption is by the time I'm talking to someone, their skills should already be there. So now I'm just looking for, do you have the right mind? Okay. And finishing up on, on recruiting specifically, um, in the early days, companies like us um, are going to be in a situation where the founders do all recruiting. How long should that continue for? Like at what point should you consider either hiring a recruiter or like getting some kind of agency um, involved? Yeah, I think two separate answers because I think... Um, if you are a founder or a senior leader in a company, like never stop uh, <laughs> being extremely involved. Um, but it will make sense at a certain point to bring on some expertise. But I think that you can't see that as now I've delegated building my team. Now we have a team that builds our team. Um, I think recruitment organizations are only successful if the leaders of that company are deeply involved. So even at Adyen um, today, as a management board, we. Um, we interview every single person that joins the company. Um, and what often will come up for us as a company of over 4,000 people is like, oh, that's not very scalable. And we're like, yeah, it's not. But it's a really good way to make sure that we care and are careful about who we're bringing on board, why, and that we keep that kind of level setting, um, that we have a really high talent bar, we won't compromise. 
And maybe even more importantly, that means that everybody that joins the company has spoken to one of us. So it also breaks down that barrier. Like they know somebody in senior leadership, they can pick up the phone and call us. Like we have a very low hierarchy environment and we start that before someone's even joined. That they're gonna know us, we're gonna have a normal conversation, you're gonna see that we're humans and um, if you need help, like if someone wants to like call us to help on a deal like two years later, like we remember them, we spoke to them. Oh, that's cool. All right, so we have 10 minutes left. Let's zoom out from like individual hires and talk more about sort of building and leading your, your team. Um, and let's start with, um, you know, a decision every leader has to make over and over again is, is when do you hire? In other words, like how quickly do you grow your team? So what's the right way to approach that question? <laughs> this is also one where people are looking for the magic uh, ratio. Yes. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we really have this mentality, particularly on uh, what we call like our staff roles or functions, um, that in some ways every hire we make is a failure of automation. So we try to have this very high bar to hire because we want, we want to have this obligation as leaders that everyone's job stays really interesting. And to keep everyone's job really inter interesting, you can't have roles where there's a lot of data entry, you're doing like manual paperwork or processes. Um, and I think that if you give in to the temptation to overhire, you often lose criticality on what can we automate, what can we make a computer do so that we don't have to. Um, and I don't have some perfect golden ratio, but I think that you need teams that think in that way. And of course, your engineers will have a tech mindset, but how do you, as you start to have different um, types of profiles within your teams, like how do you keep that mindset of, we want like tools, automation, and processes that do all of the terrible work that nobody wants to do, and every hire we make is doing something really impactful, and they see the results of their work. Um, and I realize this is not a super helpful answer because you're still like, how do we know when to hire? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think you'll find that balance within your own company, and don't give into the temptation to just solve all your problems with people. All right, so now my favorite question on our agenda today is that um, in the past two months, it seems like, like all the startup ecosystem has been able to talk, to, has been, talk about has been founder mode, uh, coined by, by Brian Chesky of, of Airbnb. And founder mode at its core is a rejection of, of middle management um, and a celebration or an encouragement for senior leadership to get involved in the like day-to-day -day details. So what's your take on this? Because you work at a very, very big company where there's got to be some middle managers. Um, to what extent is that a good idea and to what extent is it not? <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, uh, and we, we experienced this, right? I think we resisted having a lot of layers of leadership for a very long time, and I would recommend that. I think uh, it, it worked out well for us. Um, at one point, um, we had far too many people reporting into a single person, and then you start to just have a, how do I even talk to my manager? They're so busy. Everybody is asking for the, no one's getting feedback. You know, those sorts of issues start to appear. And then you do need to build out those layers. But I think, um, I like this discussion because we feel very strongly that leaders without content are not inspiring leaders. Like I would never work for a leader that I couldn't have an interesting content-based discussion about and they were just a people manager and um, you know, being like, it's your one-on-one. -on -one. What have you delivered with your OKRs? What are you trying to do next week? Like, that's not, that's not an inspirational way of working, I think, for highly ambitious way people. I think you want to walk into a room with your leader and you want to jump on a whiteboard. You want to, like, say, this is a massive problem. No one's figured out how to solve. How are we going to do it? Um, and that's how you also retain good people. So I think you can have multiple layers of management, but you can't lose... Uh, the, it, you can't be out of touch with the content. And you need leaders that actually care about the company that they're building and they feel like they're building the company because that's who great people want to work for. And you don't optimize for where great managers, or for uh, where managers want to work, you, work, you optimize for where, where great people want to work. Okay, I'm going to continue with the contentious question. So cool. for me personally, the like, top three decisions I regret the most in my like, limited uh, leadership experience is not letting go of someone who was underperforming. And no one ever talks about firing on the slush stage. We're going to talk about firing. Um, what did I do wrong in those situations? What should I have done when I have someone on my team who's, who's not doing well? Yeah, I, I think it's funny that apparently no one ever wants to talk about this at Slush. We, uh, as a company, are always happy to talk about it. I think... Uh, 
letting people go quickly and kindly is one of the best skills that you can build as a company. Um, sometimes a company grows out of people, sometimes people grow out of a company, um, sometimes there's just a mismatch, you needed certain skills then, now it's something different. I think letting it go on too long when both sides know it's not working, you just created a very toxic environment. Um, and I think it's better to spend time on, hey, what's actually best for this person? Because if you're thinking about what's best for your own anxiety, that might be avoiding a tough conversation. Um, but yeah, I always say like every leader, the first few people that they let go, the biggest thing they say afterwards is, we should have done it sooner. And it wasn't kind to that person. We put them in this environment where they're getting negative feedback, criticism, they're not, they're not getting traction. Um, it's not nice for that person either. So what is the kindest way of parting? Be extremely thoughtful in how you approach that and have a very human conversation. If you stop seeing your team members as human that like deserve respect, then that's what you should be worried about. <laughs> sure. And continuing on the topic of inexperienced leaders, um, you said earlier that everyone is a bad leader for the first few years, um, which may be bad news to like half the audience who are early stage founders <laughs> leading their, their first team ever. Um, what, what should all of us take away from that statement? Yeah, I think it's one of those things where first you have to figure out your style and how you like to be managed might not be what people on your team need or like. I mean, I always say, like, I was fine in an uh, environment of, if I hear nothing, it's all okay. Uh, but I've had plenty of people on my team that if I, you know, dig into them with something that they need feedback on or a project that they're stuck on, then they just take off. And I'm like, oh, that was like 10 minutes of my time and now this person is doing way more than I could ever do on that project. Amazing. Like, that's what, that's the positive return of being a leader. I think that's why people actually enjoy it, is when you actually see that, you know, a small intervention or a piece of feedback, you know, people seeing their blind spot. Um, but you have to get into a rhythm with it. Like, uh, I always say, like, the best leaders that I've worked with, they've just dealt with a lot of problems a lot of times, and they've figured out the best way of approaching it. They figured out where they're not strong, and then they have people around them that are stronger in that area, um, and they know where they have kind of their like superpowers. And what about when you're hiring leaders? Like, let's say Realm does well, and now we need someone to lead our engineers, or like between our CTO and our engineers. When should you get experienced sort of managers from the outside versus promote someone from within who, again, may not have any any leadership experience? Again, I think there's power in the combination, but I really believe that if you want long-term people at your company, which I mean for us is our top priority, like we don't get a lot of someone that only joins us for a year or two, um, then you owe them like a place where they can build a career. And that doesn't have to be into, into leadership, that can be into, you know, moving to another country, moving to another team, but I think when you uh, put people into leadership positions that know your company super well, they know your product super well, and they're ambassadors of your culture, like that means so much more. If you build a layer of completely external leadership hires, like there's, I don't think there's anything more toxic you can do as a company. If you grow forever and never hire anyone with outside leadership experience, I think you start to realize you have blinders on. Um, and I think that you just have to go on for as long as you can without compromising like who you were in those early days that made you special. Um, but you can't become arrogant and think that there's no other good experience out there. So I guess the, the theme of all of this is balance. All right. But all right. I would skew more towards internal promotion than external hires. Okay. Okay. That's loud and clear. All right. And I think we have time for one last question. We're going to uh, end on a similar note as the one we started with. So who, Brooke, is the best leader you've ever worked with and, and why? Who? It's a good question. I've been lucky to work with really amazing leaders, and I think at different points in my career, I needed different things. So I think in the in the early days, I was like learning from another, like a great recruitment leader of like the the art of recruitment, and I learned so many amazing lessons from her of just like how to do the job really well. Um, but then I think at Adjun, I've had the privilege of reporting into leaders of the of the company and of the business, and I think 
for me, that's taught me so many different angles of like how you build a company, how you think through like real business problems, how you tackle, you know, what feels like a controversy today, but in, you know, six months you kind of forgot it happened. Um, but yeah, I actually, I don't, I don't think I've had a, a bad leader and I've tried to like take the best of each person. Okay, you're lucky. Well, that's, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Brooke. It's awesome being with you, Aaron. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you.